Welcome everybody to this, the final talk for this term. Um, as usual, please put your questions in the chat box or on the Google form that is linked to it. And then I will read these out at the end to the speaker. So today we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Katie Amato to the series. Katie is dialing in from Northwestern University in Evanston, Chicago. Katie trained as a biologist and after studying plants turned to primates. Her PhD was in ecology, evolution and conservation biology, looking at host microbe interactions in howler monkeys. So she now has a lab devoted to the study of the microbiome in primates, including humans. And that brings us to the topic of today's talk, which is on the human gut microbiome and health inequities. Um, thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, it's a real honor to be part of this seminar series. Um, and today, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about the human microbiome and health inequities. Uh, and as I was saying to some people a little bit ago, this is kind of a, a call to action and uh, an outline of some of the pathways that could potentially be operating in terms of um, the microbiome interacting with health inequities, but there's a lot to do still. And so I really hope to generate discussion and, and ultimately studies moving forward around this topic. Um, so to start with, um, I'll give a brief background on health inequities, right? We know that there are inequities in health outcomes, um, both you know within certain countries and then across the world globally. Um, so if, you know, these are often linked to socioeconomic status. So for example, in the US, men in the highest and lowest percentile of income have an approximately 15 year difference in life expectancy. Uh, but in addition to socioeconomic status, uh, socially constructed categories like self-identified race, um, uh, the, the social kind of um, consequences that come with sexual identity and gender status, these can also be powerful predictors of many health outcomes. So for instance, when we control for socioeconomic status, black adults in the US have triple the odds of being diagnosed with diabetes compared to white adults. Um, and LGBTQ adults are twice as likely to report multiple risks for cardiovascular disease than heterosexual individuals. So we can't check this up only in a socioeconomic status. And because we're talking about um, race in this talk, I want to be really clear what we mean or what I mean when I'm talking about race, um, because often terms like race, ethnicity and ancestry kind of get interchanged. Um, and often there's an implication that there's some genetic underpinning to some of these terms when there isn't necessarily. So to be clear, when we're talking about race, there is no genetic or biological basis for race, right? Um, these are socially constructed categories that were designed by certain groups of people to control access to power and resources. Um, and when we're talking about race, often we use these very broad terms that really shows us that these are social categories, right? Um, so again, in the US, Asian American um, would be a racial category, but really people that fall into that racial category come from many different places globally and will have very different underlying genetics. Um, so while there may be genetic underpinnings to the biology of certain people from certain locations, Right, we have to really think about those specific locations and the specific environmental conditions that were there and link those to the genetics, not just grouping people that come from many different locations um, as you know, under these racial categories like Asian American. Okay, um, So if we want to talk about ancestry, we can talk about genetics. Um, but if we're talking about race, we're really talking about these socially constructed categories. Now, these social, socially constructed categories may not have biology as an underpinning, but they certainly can affect biology, right? And so there's multiple social and environmental pathways to inequity as a result of these social categorizations. Um, people can experience discrimination at a personal level, right? So personal experiences with discrimination can create stress and trauma. But there's also structural discrimination, right? Who has access to economic resources? Um, what sorts of policies and laws are put into practice? And who do they benefit and who do they exclude? And this can also lead to um, differences in people's environments and things like stress and trauma, right? And so this is where we really get the social and environmental pathways to inequity, um, where people are experiencing the world differently, whether it's socially or environmentally, as a result of either personal or structural discrimination. And these experiences can then affect their biology. Now, this is not a new concept, right? People have been studying this for a long time. 
Um, and there's been a lot of interest as a result in what are the pathways through which these social and environmental factors can affect people's biology and ultimately health. One of the examples of this is looking at um, stress and how that leads to inflammation and then the downstream effects that could have on many body systems. Uh, but I'd like to argue today that there are likely other pathways um, and I'll focus on the microbiome as one of those pathways in particularly that could be operating either in addition to this inflammation pathway or it could actually be part of this inflammation pathway as well. Um, so what is the microbiome? The microbiome is the collection of microbes that live in and on the human body. Um, these are bacteria, archaea, viruses, and microscopic eukaryotes. Generally, when people are talking about the microbiome currently, they're usually talking about the bacterial community. That's the most well studied. Um, but the other microbes that live in and on the body are certainly having an impact. And we know from the past couple decades of research that the environment can influence the structure and function of the microbiome, and the structure and function of the microbiome can then influence host physiology. And so we should really be thinking about this as a potentially really important pathway for understanding how environments can affect health, particularly in the context of discrimination. So to give you some examples, the gut microbiota is influenced by things like diet, um, so it can help a uh, host digest their food. Uh, it break down, breaks down fiber, which we do not have the enzymes for, and it can also detoxify things like plant secondary metabolites, and it can even help metabolize medications. Um, for that reason, things like medications um, and hygiene practices, other parts of our daily lives can also affect what the microbiome looks like, um, because as we um, kind of shift the types of medications that are going into the body, the types of microbes that can metabolize those might be different, and there may be a shift in the competitive regime. And that's what happens when we change diet as well, right? If a diet goes from high fiber to low fiber, there's different types of microbes that may be able to best um, compete in that environment um, in terms of talking about the gut specifically. And so you may get shifts in the microbial community. And finally, social networks, we know that how people interact with each other can result in them sharing microbes. We think about this a lot right now with the pandemic in terms of sharing a pathogenic um, microbe, right, a virus. Um, but we can also share microbes that we think are potentially beneficial and these operate via a lot of the same pathways. Um, now, the gut microbiota is influenced by those factors, but it also influences nutrition, immune function, and behavior. So I already mentioned that it can break down certain compounds in our diet and help facilitate digestion. It can also program metabolism and make people more likely to, to um, deposit fat or alter blood glucose levels. Um, it's known to train the immune function in, in early life, so train the immune system, and then it can actually affect immune uh, function later in life. And it's also been associated with behavior. So um, it can affect uh, uh, behaviors such as um, like anxiety type behaviors or risking behaviors. There's a connection between the gut and the brain um, that's currently being explored more. So because of all this, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand how the microbiome could impact health. But one of the key questions we have to think about um, before we can really get into those questions is what is a healthy microbiome? And this is a huge question that the field is still working on. But two of the things that we think we know at this point are that in general, increased microbial diversity, at least in the gut, tends to be a good thing, we think, um, particularly in adulthood. In infancy, it's a slightly different. I'm happy to talk about that in the questions if people are interested. Um, but having more types of microbes in the gut microbiome tends to be better for the same reasons we think about biodiversity being important in macroecology in a forest, for example, right? Um, there's redundancy of uh, functions, right? So if you lose a certain microbe, another microbe could potentially step in and perform the same function. Um, more of the resources are being taken up in that ecosystem. And so it's harder for invaders to come in. And in this case, we can think about potential pathogens being invaders. And so diversity, we think, tends to signal a healthy microbiome. Um, but we also want to think about community function and the identity of microbes and how they interact. And, and that really seems to matter. And so I have this example here of these network diagrams. Um, and you can see on the, the left, there's a diagram where the microbes are highly interconnected and are relying on each other versus another one where they're less connected. And so understanding which microbes are important for maintaining those connections and what would happen if you lose one of those microbes can also be important for understanding health. 
Um, so because we have all of these factors operating in terms of the environmental impacts on the microbiome and then the microbiome potentially impacting health, we can really think about how we can integrate this into our understanding of health inequities. And so you can imagine um, that there could be personal and structural discrimination based on social categories or, or social reactions to um, people's identities in the terms of race, gender, sexual identity, and socioeconomic status. Um, and these can operate at the individual, household, neighborhood, or global level um, and change people's social in environments and their physical environments. Um, and they can alter things like dietary quality, quantity, diversity, um, the type of stress or abuse they're exposed to, access to safe outdoor spaces, um, you know, their ability to breastfeed, uh, exposure to pollutants and pathogens, and even can affect um, their circadian rhythms. And all of these things could potentially affect the microbiome, which could then feed back and affect health. This is a question though, do we think that these pathways are potentially operating? So let me talk through um, some of the evidence that's out there in the literature currently that structural inequities could be affecting the microbiome. I want to start by talking about infancy um, because this is when the microbiome establishes. In utero, the environment is believed to be mostly sterile and infants are first exposed to the microbiome at or shortly after birth. And so practices that happen during and after birth could be very important in terms of shaping the microbiome um, and its developmental trajectory downstream. Um, so for example, we know um, on the left here that birth mode affects the gut microbiome. And so there's a figure here on the left, bottom left, um, which is an ordination plot. So each point represents the microbial community of um, the body site of a single individual and points that are closer together have a more similar microbial community composition and points that are farther apart have a more distinct microbial community composition. And you can see that babies here that are born vaginally have a microbiome that looks more like mom's vaginal uh, microbiome, whereas babies that are born via C-section have a microbiome that looks more like mom's skin microbiome. And so these differences in the types of microbes that first colonize the baby's body could have important impacts for health moving forward. But at this point, we know that at least for sure, there's a difference in the type of microbes that babies are being exposed to because of that environmental factor of how they were born. Um, in the middle panel here, breastfeeding we know affects the microbiome. This is a study where they looked at the effect of antibiotics, that's what IAP stands for, as well as birth mode, as well as breastfeeding. And so these are bar charts that are showing the relative abundance of certain microbes. And it doesn't really matter which microbes are which, I just want you to see that there are differences, right? Both with, uh, uh, regard to what the birth mode was, um, but also breastfeeding. Um, and in fact, breastfeeding, we think can reduce some of the differences um, that we see associated with C-section in babies. It can actually um, kind of reestablish the microbial community and counteract some of those environmental effects of C-section. Um, but babies that are being fed more formula are potentially going to get a different microbial exposure. And this is because breast milk not only has microbes in it, um, live microbes in it, but it also has um, oligosaccharides that can only be digested by the types of microbes that you would expect to see in the infant gut. Um, so not having that biological input from breast milk can alter the types of microbes that are establishing in baby's gut. And then finally, um, uh, contact between infants and their caregivers is thought to be very important. And so thinking about um, different patterns in contact is really important for thinking what types of microbes um, babies are going to be exposed to. Um, so the graph here is actually a graph from um, non-human primates, from baboons. This is where we have some of the best social contact data on the microbiome. And you see the strength of the grooming relationship between baboons increases as you move to the right, and the dissimilarity of the microbiome between individuals decreases. So the more individuals groom, the more similar their microbiome is. And it's important to think about um, C-sections, breastfeeding, and um, contact with caregivers in the context of health inequities, because we know that not all populations um, have uh, the ability to engage in all of these practices, right? There are certain populations that are disproportionately 
um, getting C-sections, which can lead to inequities, um, particularly in the United States. Uh, particularly Black women tend to have higher rates of C-section. Um, whether people are getting paid leave or not can affect um, the extent to which they can breastfeed, as well as the type of advice that they're getting early in baby's life, if they're getting that social support to encourage breastfeeding or not. And then whether, again, there's parental leave and parents are taking care of infants or the infants in a, a daycare sort of setting, all of these things can change the microbial exposures that infants have. And we know that these things track along um, social categories. And so it's really important to start thinking about this. Now, the infant microbiome is believed to um, uh, mature over about the first three years of life. Uh, so about three years, it becomes more stable and in kind of a more adult-like state, uh, but it can still be affected by the environment after that. Um, so this is an example of a study in adults looking at diet shifts. Um, this was a group of people that shifted from whatever their normal diet was to either a completely plant-based diet or a completely animal-based diet for four days. And basically here you're seeing kind of change compared to baseline in the overall microbial community composition. And so you can see that particularly for the people that were consuming an animal-based diet, right, you have a very big change in the microbiome in response to that diet, even within a period of two days. So you can really see the types of foods that people are eating are going to affect their microbiome. And again, we have disparities in this, right? We have global disparities in the types of foods that people have access to, right? If people have access to more processed or animal-based diets as a result of an industrialized diet, that is going to potentially affect the microbiome. And you can also think about this on a little more local scale in terms of food deserts and what types of foods do people have access to? Do they have access to more plants um, and fiber-rich diets, or are they being forced to eat more fast food, right, which is going to potentially negatively influence the microbiome? Um, speaking of environmental exposure, um, the types of spaces that we inhabit can affect the types of microbes that are associated with our bodies. So the indoor spaces that we're exposed to mostly have microbes associated with us, with people. Um, and getting outdoors uh, improves uh, exposure to environmental microbes, which we think is a good thing. And so this is actually um, a figure um, from a study where they had uh, children in a daycare, um, either a standard daycare that had kind of a, a concrete kind of wood and metal playground, um, or a nature-based daycare. Um, where children were being um, uh, brought into the forest every day. And this is basically how diverse was the microbiome of the skin of these children. And you can see the children in the, the nature-based daycare had a much higher microbial diversity than those in the standard daycare. Um, and sorry, yes, than in the standard daycare. Um, and they actually did an intervention where they brought in like buckets of dirt for the kids to play with into this normal playground. And you can see that there's an increase um, in this microbial community richness after diversity after they did this. And so being exposed to these outdoor environments appears to have a very positive effect on the diversity of the microbiome. All right, two more examples of the environment affecting the microbiome and why you need to think about this in terms of health inequities. Um, and I'll just go back a second, I didn't mention that here. Um, but, you know, there are certain neighborhoods, particularly in urban settings, that have more access to outdoor green spaces and that people can actually get out there and interact with these microbial exposures compared to neighborhoods where there isn't safe green uh, space exposure, right? And so this is going to, again, be an issue for people being exposed to these potentially beneficial microbes, and it's going to create disparities in the types of microbiomes that people have. Um, antibiotics and medications. This is another one of those um, ordination plots where you're just looking at similarity between points. How close together are they? And these are people that went on to um, different um, doses of antibiotics. And here you can see that the response is quite different. So some people, um, each color represents a person um, and each kind of shade of that color is kind of the, the round of antibiotics that they were on. Um, some people have a very kind of similar microbiome no matter how many antibiotics they're taking. Um, but other people like this person in blue here, right, the more antibiotics they take, kind of the more distinct their microbiome becomes, the more dissimilar the points are for that person. And so thinking about who has access to antibiotics and who doesn't, or what types of medications people are taking as a result of their health issues can also lead to um, disparities in these exposures and ultimately the microbiome. In this context, I particularly like to think about access to healthcare and whether people are ending up in places like emergency rooms, um, either for preventative treatment or because they couldn't get preventative treatment and they end up with a more kind of acute um, issue, they're more likely to have exposure to antibiotics as a result of that emergency room visit, which can then have a disproportionate impact on their microbiome.
Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is circadian dysregulation. Um, believe it or not, um, people's circadian dysregulation can actually affect the microbiome and its composition. And so it's really important to think about this when we're thinking about shift work and which populations of people are having to work shift work um, and essentially dysregulate their circadian rhythms um, and how that could affect the microbiome. And so these data here are actually from mice um, because it's much easier to control <laughs> um, them in this context. Um, but you have basically a baseline night, night, night day cycle, pardon me, um, and then a circadian dysregulated cycle. And you can see that the diversity of the microbiome decreases in response to that uh, circadian dysregulation. So all of this goes to say that there's plenty of evidence um, that the environment affects the microbiome. And we know that there are disparities in those environments um, that often fall along lines associated with certain social categories and how people are being treated or which neighborhoods they're being um, either forced to live in or have to live in because of necessity. Um, and those are going to affect the microbiome and what it looks like. So then what is the potential health impact of this? Let's talk about what sort of evidence we have in the literature. Um, I'm going to go through a few examples, and on each slide, I'm going to have data from humans and data from mouse studies. And this is because mouse studies in the microbiome field are often held up as kind of a standard for causal inference in the microbiome. And we, and we can talk about the issues with those models, um, with mice as a model for that. Um, but this is essentially um, supposed to be um, kind of moving towards evidence that the microbiome could be causing these health outcomes, and that they're not just a symptom necessarily. Um, so in terms of um, nutritional diseases, I want to talk about undernutrition first. Um, the data set that I'm showing on the left here um, is from individuals that are malnourished. Um, and these are, these are children here. This dashed line here um, is what was um, determined to be kind of the normal uh, pattern of microbial maturation in early life. And um, these are the um, children that were being sampled that were um, malnourished. And so you can see they're falling below that line of what we would expect in terms of normal microbial maturation. Um, so there's this kind of stunting of the microbiome associated with undernutrition. And when you put um, the microbiomes from um, children that are either healthy in red here or have malnutrition in um, blue here, you can actually see that the mice lose weight more when they get the microbiome from um, individuals that were um, had malnutrition. And there's actually a diet intervention here, which fixes it. And then when uh, the mice are put back on kind of a pseudo Malawian diet, we start to see kind of that decrease in weight again. Um, so just putting the microbes into mice that have no microbes of their own um, shows that there's these physiological differences that the, microbi the microbes are contributing to. Um, if we look at metabolic disease like obesity, um, we also see a potentially causal role of the microbiome. Um, these are data from lean and obese twins. Um, and you can see individuals that are lean have a higher microbial diversity compared to individuals that are obese. And when you put those into these germ-free mice, right, mice that um, get the microbes from lean twins um, have essentially no change in fat mass, but mice that get the microbes from obese twins have an increase in fat mass. So again, there's this potentially causal relationship that the microbes from um, a person that is obese cause the mouse to become obese. So these shifts in the microbiome can have uh, important health implications for metabolism and nutrition. Um, if we want to think about um, asthma and allergies, um, there's evidence here that something similar may be happening. Um, these here on the left are data from children um, that were either controls um, that didn't have any symptoms of asthma, um, and then children that had at atopy and wheeze, atopy only or wheeze only. And again, these are the relative abundances of different types of microbes. And I want you to just look at the general patterns and see that um, these kids that have um, kind of different asthma symptoms or that have asthma versus don't have asthma at all um, have a different microbial community that is associated with them. What's interesting is if we again put these into mice um, and we look at inflammation in the mice, um, mice that have no microbes that are, aren't exposed to the microbes from um, children that have asthma um, have a relatively low inflammation score. Um, these are the mice that then get microbes um, from the children that have asthma. Um, so they have increased inflammation. And then they actually added in this experiment microbes that they thought were protective against asthma based on their correlational analyses. And they saw there was actually a reduction in inflammation when those microbes were added back into the mice. So again, a potential causal role for the microbiome affecting inflammation, which can then affect asthma symptoms.
Um, a few more examples here um, in thinking about the gut-brain interaction. Um, this is a study um, where they were looking at um, infants that were born uh, prematurely. Um, and we have the infants um, that were um, scored in terms of their cognitive development in kind of uh, three different uh, clusters. And we essentially see that um, there's different um, microbial development associated um, with these different um, kind of cognitive development scores. Um, so infants that were in this kind of lower group here um, have a lower, uh, different microbiome, and they had this lower cognitive development score compared to individuals kind of in the middle or at the top. And then here they put the microbes again into mice. Um, these were either from um, in premature infants that fell into kind of that low group of low cognitive development versus higher. And then these kind of yellow and teal are, are control mice. So mice that have no microbes or conventional mice that do have microbes. And we're looking at inflammation scores associated with getting the microbes from those different donors. And again, you can see there's much higher inflammation scores um, in the mice that received microbes from infants that were falling lower on that cognitive development score, suggesting that there may be an interaction between the microbiome, inflammation, and cognitive development in pre preterm infants. Um, in terms of gut brain, we can also think about depression um, and other um, mental illnesses. Uh, so this is a study from people who either had major depressive disease, uh, disease or um, were controls, healthy controls. And these are simply microbes that they found were enriched in one group versus the other, right? So again, these differences in the microbiome, if we observationally look at populations of people that either have depression or don't. Um, they then would put the microbes into germ-free mice again and looked at changes in activity in the germ-free mice. And they actually found that the mice showed less activity in both the elevated maze challenge as well as the open field. And we can debate um, whether we think this is, uh, a, that it's actually useful to associate these changes in activity patterns with depression in humans. Um, that might be a stretch. But essentially, we are seeing that putting these microbes into mice at least changes their behavior in some meaningful way. And the last thing I wanted to touch on that we don't know a lot about yet, but I think is worth mentioning, um, is reactions to respiratory illnesses like COVID-19. Um, so these are data that were published just last year um, on COVID-19 um, and people that either had COVID-19 and were hospitalized um, after they were hospitalized or people that didn't have COVID-19. Um, and you can again see differences in the composition of the microbiome in these different groups of people. Um, do we think this matters in terms of how people are reacting to the virus um, or their susceptibility? Well, the first thing I'll say is that we know that a lot of um, kind of underlying chronic disease that people have become risk factors uh, for COVID-19 severity, right? And so uh, I've just showed you evidence that the microbiome can contribute to some of those underlying factors. But then we also know that the microbiome can interact with inflammation and can actually affect how uh, the immune system responds to respiratory disease. Um, so on the right here, this is a mouse study um, and it's um, RSV, it's not COVID-19. But essentially, they changed the mouse diets um, from right kind of control fat to high fat diet and looked at, um, sorry, high fiber. This is control fiber and high fiber, pardon me, not fat. Um, and so they could actually see that fiber is, is supposed to be good for the microbiome, encourage diversity, et cetera. And mice that had this higher fiber diet had a lower inflammation score when they were infect infected with RSV compared to mice that had a kind of a control fiber diet. Um, so again, this is a little bit more indirect, but evidence that the type of microbiome that individuals have can actually affect how their immune system is responding to viruses, even if that virus is in the lungs and not in the gut. So I would suggest based on kind of this literature that's out there about the interactions between the environment, the microbiome and health more generally, um, that we really should be thinking about these pathways in the context of health inequities, right? If we know that these um, environmental factors are different according to how people are being treated based on these social categories that they're in, um, then the microbiome is, you know, is probably also going to be different because of different exposures and that's going to potentially increase health risks for people, um, particularly these health risks that have been associated with the microbiome. Um, so what kind of literature do we have out there about these specific interactions in terms of thinking about um, kind of social experiences and how they're affecting the microbiome? 
Um, I'm going to show you some tables. These are the studies that were out there. Um, I guess I haven't checked in the last six months. Um, but these are studies that are looking explicitly at the relationship between socioeconomic status and the microbiome. So not just controlling for it, but actually like that's the point of the paper. Um, you'll see that there's not a whole lot out there. Um, there's three papers on adults. Um, I think this is they're starting to be more in the pipeline. Um, but a lot of these um, are looking at relatively small sample sizes, um, and they're also looking at kind of different levels of environmental, um, or, or they're kind of uh, measuring socioeconomic status differently. Um, I'll point out um, this Miller paper and this Boyer paper um, are both really interesting in that they find that you can actually um, predict somebody's microbial diversity based on their socioeconomic status. So the Miller paper is in Chicago. You can actually um, predict what zip code somebody is from based on their microbiome. Um, and Boyer et al. found the similar pattern that increased socioeconomic status was associated with increased microbial diversity. Um, here are the studies that are out there so far in race and ethnicity um, explicitly. Um, I will say that a lot of these studies are using race and ethnicity interchangeably. Um, so they're not really looking at this through the context of discrimination and understanding how environmental impacts are affecting the microbiome. Um, they're more just kind of categorizing people and looking for differences. Um, there's not a whole lot out there, but the, the papers that do look at this generally do find differences across racial groups in terms of the microbiome. And then finally, in terms of sexual and gender identity, there's essentially nothing out there that I can find published at this point. Um, all of the microbiome studies that deal with sexual and gender identity uh, tend to be looking at um, uh, HIV risk or HIV um, kind of progression in men that have sex with men, and that's it. There's nothing uh, that is considering kind of people's lived experiences and the environments they're exposed to as a result of their sexual and gender identity and how that could be affecting the microbiome. So there's a little bit out there, um, but there's a lot of gaps. And so I would argue um, that we really need to um, start building on these papers. And some of the kind of key factors that I can pull out there are first that we need to better operationalize and quantify racism and discrimination. Um, a lot of times, um, these kind of social categories or concepts are thrown into papers as controls or are mentioned, um, but people aren't actually defining what they need and they're not actually measuring the racism. Um, they're just measuring differences across racial groups of people. And so I think we really need to kind of push this literature farther by um, really measuring what we mean to measure, right? Um, understanding people's environmental and social exposures. Um, we also need to explore multiple levels of inequality and their relative importance or their interactions, right? Um, so I talked about how you could have um, kind of different experiences and these might be happening at different scales from the personal level and individual level all the way up to the global scale. Um, but most papers are focusing only on one of those, um, if that. Um, and we really need to think about how this could be operating across different scales and which one seems to be more important in terms of shaping environments and ultimately the microbiome. Along similar lines, we really need to empirically link social and environmental factors, the microbiome and health outcomes into a single study, right? I just showed you kind of a smattering of the literature that doesn't even deal with health disparities, but kind of deals with each of those arrows separately um, in terms of the environment affecting the microbiome and the microbiome affecting health. Um, but even in the context of those papers that I showed you about the SES and microbiome or race and the microbiome, um, the papers will either focus on the environment affecting the microbiome or the microbiome affecting health, and they kind of don't put the whole chain together. Um, usually they say, oh, there's differences in the microbiome of these groups of people, kind of end of story. Um, and we don't necessarily know why or what the potential health implications are. And so I think we really need to start to string those things together. And also establishing mechanisms and causality, right? Um, so it's all well and good to, to point out these patterns um, and identify potential pathways that are operating. Um, but can we really get in and look at how the microbiome is interacting, let's say, with inflammatory pathways, right? Or can we get um, kind of better information either with more um, animal model studies or other sorts of kind of um, observational studies that can get at causality better um, beyond some of the kind of the descriptive studies that we're currently seeing in the literature. And then finally, I want to point out that we really need to elucidate the relative importance of the microbiome and other pathways. Um, like a lot of the kind of new fancy tools that come out, microbiome tends to be very um, kind of uh, 
self-focused, right? And that people like to associate the microbiome with everything and say that it's driving all of these patterns. Um, but the microbiome is not the only thing that's affecting health disparities, and it's not the only thing that's affecting um, pathways of environmental impacts and biology. And so we really need to start to uh, integrate some of these other pathways and try to understand what roles the microbiome playing in the context of all the other things that we know might be going on. Um, so for this reason, I would say that we, you know, we really need comprehensive data from interdisciplinary studies. So thinking about how can we combine the microbiology and kind of the experimental biology um, with the social sciences where, you know, people in the social sciences really have experience with operationalizing things like um, racism and other types of discrimination um, and measuring people's social and environmental exposures. And can we get those people talking to the people that are generating um, kind of this more experimental um, or molecular microbiome data so that we're getting kind of these more um, interdisciplinary studies that give us a, a more robust picture of what might be going on in the context of health disparities. And I'd also like to point out that we need to be generating this data in a way that makes it actionable. So many of the microbiome studies that are currently published, in fact, um, I just saw a paper that just came out. Um, I think it's something like 70% of all human microbiome studies that are currently published um, come from essentially, um, you know, uh, North American and European populations. Um, and it's something like 46% of the studies that are currently published come from the US um, and are based on US populations. Um, and the US populations that are being targeted are generally um, you know, white populations, non-diverse populations. And so we need to have um, kind of better representation uh, in the participants of these studies, right? If we're thinking about health disparities and how the microbiome could be interacting with that, we need to be studying those populations that are experiencing those disparities and really trying to understand the dynamics there in those populations rather than the dynamics in the populations that aren't having the same sorts of health outcomes and health issues. Um, and, and this comes from not only ensuring that those participants are being um, kind of recruited and, and made part of the research, um, endeavor, but also who's doing the research, right? Um, ensuring that we're really kind of um, representing all parties of interest um, so that we can develop science that's actually useful to the people that most need it. Um, and so the last thing I want to talk about along those lines um, is kind of what can we do moving forward? How can we actually leverage the microbiome to reduce health inequities? Um, and the kind of two domains I want to talk about briefly here um, are thinking about targeted biomedical interventions and then ecologically inspired interventions. So microbiome has generated a lot of excitement in the kind of personalized medicine sphere and kind of the biotechnology sphere um, because the microbiome is relatively flexible um, and can essentially be engineered. Um, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand exactly which microbes are performing which function. And if a microbe is missing, can we produce some sort of probiotic or some sort of other intervention that um, encourages the proliferation of certain microbes in the gut um, to kind of go in and, and treat a certain disease? Um, the flip side of that is trying to think about ways that we can actually um, encourage and support the development of kind of a strong microbial ecological community, right? Um, so can we actually provide people with exposure to the right sorts of microbes during the right times in their life um, so that they're actually developing a robust, diverse microbial community um, that maybe there's uh, kind of less potential for us to have to intervene with it in the future, right? A kind of preventative approach, if you will. Um, and I think both of these are important to think about. Um, the targeted biomedical interventions are extremely exciting to think about, but we also have to think about um, how those interventions are being developed and how they're being distributed. So, um, you know, again, if we're developing these interventions based on only like white affluent populations, um, that same intervention is maybe not going to work across populations since we know that microbial communities differ across populations. Um, so we really need to make sure that we're developing these targeted interventions based on either a diverse population or that we're specifically pulling participants from populations that we think would most benefit from it. And who's going to be able to afford these sorts of interventions and how are they going to be distributed? Again, if these interventions are being distributed through kind of normal healthcare um, 
avenues in places like the United States, you're still going to have people that are being excluded from access for that sort of intervention, right? Because they don't have the access to the medical system that they need to be able to afford that sort of medication or even know that it exists, right? Um, and so again, really working with um, scientists and policymakers to ensure that um, kind of um, funding opportunities and the way science is being steered ensures that you're having kind of just diverse representation and that these interventions that are being developed are actually accessible to people. Um, in terms of the ecologically inspired interventions, um, that falls into kind of more of a policy realm in terms of thinking about what are the sorts of policies that are already being developed um, and where microbiome science could potentially come in and kind of uh, provide an, a value added to that policy. Um, so a, a great example of this, and in fact, a great example of this kind of interplay um, between targeted biomedical interventions and ecologically inspired interventions is thinking about breastfeeding and what types of microbes infants are getting. Um, so we know that bifidobacterium is a really important microbe in breast milk um, that infants need to have exposure to. And so sure, we could create a bifidobacteria probiotic um, for infants um, that aren't getting sufficient bifidobacteria. Um, but we should also be thinking about policies for parental leave, particularly in places like in the, like in the United States, um, where our leave policies are pretty terrible. Um, you know, are we actually giving mothers the opportunity to breastfeed to the extent that they need to, um, which will have a range of health benefits, including um, in improving that microbial exposure, right? Um, and again, thinking about, you know, not just giving um, mothers access to like places to pump breast milk, um, because actually breastfeeding is also going to increase, let's say, skin to skin contact and microbial transfer um, of, of my uh, transfer of microbes via the skin um, that you're not necessarily going to get from um, bottle feeding, even if it's pumped breast milk. Um, and we also don't know how pumping and storage of milk necessarily affects the microbiome of the milk um, or the oligosaccharides. Um, so thinking through all of those things and trying to understand how the microbiome science could actually help us improve policies about parental leave um, and kind of uh, workplace um, uh, making workplaces friendly for mothers. Um, and so the last slide I'll just end on is kind of hitting home this point um, about kind of uh, ensuring that we have this interaction between policy and research as the microbiome field moves forward, right? Um, if we can actually have uh, researchers interacting with policymakers, both so that the research is getting implemented into effective policy and so that policymakers are um, kind of guiding research in a way that's going to make it more applicable to a broader group of people. I think we're going to get kind of the most uh, benefit out of microbiome science, and we're going to have kind of the best chance at using the microbiome to start to address some of these health inequities, whether it be through, um, you know, kind of treatment after the fact or preventing these microbial um, kind of imbalances or kind of lack of exposure, if you will, um, before it even starts. Um, so with that, I would just like to thank, um, this was ba based on a, a paper that I wrote with a number of co-authors. Um, it was published in PNAS in 2021. Um, so I wanna thank all my co-authors on that paper. Um, and I also wanna thank the um, Human Capital and Economic Opportunity Working Group at the University of Chicago, um, which hosted a conference for us um, a few years back um, where we all started to talk about these themes and try to kind of put the literature together. Um, and so none of this would be without these people or without that workshop. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Katie. That was really, really brilliant and so fascinating. Um, it's so nice to see evolutionary medicine really at work, you know, um, and the questions are flooding in. Um, but I would like to just, uh, before I give anyone else a chance, ask about that. You just mentioned at this conference and then your previous slide, you said, you know, you've got these policymakers and stakeholders. How do you how do you do that? How do you get all these people talking to each other? I mean, are these conferences not just academics, for example? So that particular conference was just academics, which is not the best. Um, I think it was great for starting discussion um, because I think at that point, I think things have started to change like in the past two years or so. Um, but at that point, um, a lot of microbiome researchers, um, at least in terms of what was published, didn't seem to be thinking about those connections, um, even though it seemed like 
there were such obvious connections being made in the literature that this was kind of, kind of a fruitful way to think about it. Um, but I do, I think moving forward, we need to start to um, engage each other more in these meetings and sorts of things. Um, so I'm part of um, this research group called CIFAR that's based out of Canada. And one of the things that we're trying to do is develop um, some microbiome curriculum that could be used in kind of a module way um, in public health education. So we could pass it on to public health schools um, and they could throw in a few slides about the microbiome as it made sense in their coursework. Um, I know there's another effort from somebody who's trying to um, create teaching frameworks that could be used around the world for teachers um, in K through 12 classrooms, which is a pretty wide range, but kind of getting the idea of how microbes are interacting with our bodies and why that might matter kind of out there more in education. Um, and then I think also having these discussions with, you know, like government policymakers and things like that. So, so the more kind of workshops and efforts we can aim at that, I think the better. Um, but I know that's sometimes easier said than done, especially for those of us coming from the research side. Thank you. Okay, I'll get started on the questions through the chat box um, and I can put them on the screen as well. So uh, Enwa says, this is amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, I would be interested in the relationship between microbiome and early menarche, pubarche, adrenarche, puberty, basically. Has there been any research on that? Oh, let's see. I have not looked recently in the literature, but my in like in the past month or two. Um, but based on what I know that's out there, I would say there's not. Um, that's really an area of interest for me. I'm really interested in how the microbiome affects host energetics um, because we know that the microbe can produce, can provide the host with more energy than the host would get otherwise from their diet. Um, and so I think that time, the puberty and the timing of puberty would be a really interesting area um, to examine. Um, a lot of the microbiome studies that I've seen thus far are either from adults or they're from that like, you know, first thousand days of life. Um, and I think there's big gaps in kind of later childhood and puberty where we know a whole lot less about the microbiome and how it's interacting with physiology. Um, so my, my short answer is I don't think we know a lot and I think it would be really interesting for there to be more research. Lots of room for research. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's the fun thing and the hard thing about a relatively new uh, tool. <laughs> It's a good thing. <laughs> um, okay, so Gabrielle is asking, how related is the gut microbiome to the vaginal microbiome? So that's a great question. So they're very different. So the microbiome is very different according to different body sites. Um, and that's mostly, we think, because of the physiology of the different body sites in terms of, um, you know, how... Um, how much moisture is in a body site, what the pH of it is, if there's other um, sorts of compounds being secreted, like I think about sweat glands and things like that. Um, so the vaginal microbiome is very different from the gut microbiome. And in fact, um, what's interesting is that we think the vaginal microbiome is dominated by lactobacillus. That's generally the pattern. Although there was this, there've been a few studies where um, it turns out that that um, assumption was based on studies of um, white women. And if you actually broaden um, your sampling, um, you actually see uh, different patterns where there can actually be more diversity in the vaginal microbiome that is not associated with disease symptoms, right? So in the past, people would say, oh, that's disease, um, but it's not necessarily. So I think there's a lot to learn there still. Um, you know, there's not known there's some people that are playing with the idea of like whether microbes can translocate through the bloodstream, but if you get too many microbes in the bloodstream, that's an infection, right? And so um, I think there's, you know, that that's an interesting pathway to think about, but there's not necessarily a direct connection between the gut and the vaginal microbiome. Where I do think it's interesting is again, in, in, at birth thinking about, right? Because um, if lac we know lactobacillus is a major microbe in the vaginal microbiome, um, and that's one of the major microbes that colonizes the infant gut early on in life. Um, and so thinking about how microbes are being passed on across generations, um, I think that's where it's really interesting to think about the vaginal gut microbiome interaction. And a second question from Gabriella, how resilient is the microbiome? So we think this probably depends on the person and this is where all the kind of personalized medicine excitement comes in. Um, you know, if 
let's assume we know exactly what a perfect microbial exposure is in early life, but assuming one had that, you know, you would expect that you end up with a highly diverse, kind of highly interconnected microbial community that we would expect to be more resilient. Um, but if you have a person that doesn't have those sorts of exposures, maybe is, is consuming, you know, a high fat, low fiber diet, has lower microbial diversity, um, altered connections between microbes, we would expect that microbial community to be less resilient. Um, in terms of thinking about like how much does it change um, in humans, generally, uh, if you sample a person over time and you put it on like one of those ordination plots, the points from that individual person probably will still cluster together, even though you sample them across time. Um, but I think really has a lot to do also with like how, um, how much does that person's kind of lifestyle and diet change over time? Um, when I collect data from non-human primates in the wild, we actually don't see that pattern as much. Um, so we see like social group microbial community composition is the same. Like you can always identify what social group an individual comes from or what season and kind of what diet they were consuming when you collected it. But you're not necessarily gonna see the individual's microbiome always kind of land in the same place on that plot. So. Um, the human microbiome in some ways seems to be more stable, but I suspect that has more to do with like people, how people are behaving and interacting with the environment. Um, but that's a whole other set of interesting questions. <laughs> and maybe the lack of diversity in the sampling that you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah, also. So here's a question from Grazna Jazienska. Do we know if reproductive tract microbiome in female infants or children differs between those born vaginally or via C-section? Ooh, hmm. Well, we know really early in life, I, I believe we, it does, but it's almost so early that I, I, I'm not sure how much it matters biologically or not. It was probably an open question. Um, so essentially, you know, within, a couple days of birth, all body sites in an infant so, look somewhat similar. And so all body sites in the C-section born infant are going to look more like um, mom's skin or like the room that they were delivered in. Um, whereas all body sites from the infant that was born vaginally are going to look more like mom's vaginal microbiome. Um, that does change over time. You know, by the time you sample an infant um, at like three months or six months, the different body sites are going to be different in terms of what their microbiome looks like. Um, so I guess that's a good question. How long would those differences last? I suspect we don't know. Um, I feel like we're starting to have some of that data on the gut and how long the differences in the gut last. Um, but I'm not sure that there's been a perspective study of the vaginal microbiome over time. So another good question. More research, yeah. <laughs> um, right, uh, is there any data on microbiome, different, microbiome differences for people living at altitude? There was a paper that just came out and I'm not gonna be able to tell you what the results are. Um, there is one paper that just came out that was looking at altitudinal differences. And I know they found differences, um, but I can't remember what the biological implications of those differences were. And I suspect that they were speculated biological in implications and that they hadn't necessarily measured um, the physiology yet, um, just based on how microbiome research usually works. You usually get like, there are differences and then we figure out why those differences matter. Um, yeah. I can help you find it if you want me. I can look it up later and, and send it along. Yeah, we can post a, a, the link or something on the chat box. I, I'm happy to do that. Um, okay, so are there bi-directional relationships with some of these health aspects? For example, if the microbiome can affect depression, can being depressed also affect, uh, affect microbiome diversity? If so, how do you know which way the causal error goes or is it truly bi-directional? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, pretty much all of these relationships are bidirectional, which makes it extremely messy. Um, that's why these mouse studies have become um, popular in the microbiome literature, right? Um, despite, uh, you know, mice not always being the best models for humans and everything, um, because that way you can actually put the microbes into kind of a blank slate um, and look at the differences that emerge physiologically and be sure that the arrow at least goes that way in terms of the microbes affecting 
the host. And then, you know, you can do the opposite way too, in terms of either in an animal model that's um, kind of similar to whatever the health condition is, um, or in these observational studies of humans. Um, in terms of the gut brain, yeah, it's absolutely bidirectional. Um, depression, pardon me, off the top of my head, I know stress. Stress is, um, you know, acute stress can cause differences in the microbiome, but then we also know the microbiome um, can affect how the HBA axis develops and then can also ultimately affect um, reactivity and individuals' reactivity to stress. So yes, absolutely bidirectional. And I think that that's where we need some of these more um, controlled experimental studies to get at causality. Um, I think that's kind of the gold standard would be to have kind of more observational, um, kind of real life um, studies where we're looking at what the patterns are. And then we go into these kind of more controlled situations and try to get at mechanism and causality. And even if we know that those models aren't perfect um, or they're missing things, do we still see some of the same patterns? And can we kind of go back and forth between those study sites or study types um, to get at what's actually going on? I mean, I think that's true beyond microbiome research, right? <laughs> but... Quite. Um, okay. Uh, oh, helminths part of the microbiome, thinking about parasites that might help alleviate autoimmune diseases, right? These little worms, right? Um, yeah, no, that's another great question. So this is one of those areas where we know less, although people have been very interested in helmets, I think because they've come up as potentially important in, in kind of other areas. Um, I guess to be technically considered a microbe, you have something that basically just means you need a microscope to look at it. So um, whether or not it's microbe or not, um, you can base on that. But helmets are, uh, we think, absolutely interacting with the gut microbiome. I mean, they're in there <laughs> with them um, and they're interacting with the host. And so between all, you know, either the direct interactions or the indirect through the host, um, there's definitely an effect there. And there's actually been suggestions out there. There's a, there's a lot of studies of the microbiome globally that show that, um, for example, kind of more industrialized um, kind of urban populations um, have a distinct microbiome compared to kind of less industrialized rural populations. Um, and that's often associated with dietary differences because kind of the urban industrialized diet is higher, lower in fiber, pardon me, and higher in fat and protein. Um, but there's a lot of things that usually differ between those populations and often helminth um, exposure is one of them. Um, and so there have been studies that suggest that um, some of these differences in microbiomes across global populations that we see could actually be associated with helminths. Um, I've dabbled a little bit with parasite microbiome interaction in non-human primates, and in that literature, it appears to depend on what particular parasite you're talking about. Um, I think it probably matters kind of exactly where the parasite lives and how it's interacting with the host, um, as well as potentially like severity, right? Um, and, and, and those things are probably going to, I mean, clearly they're going to affect how the host responds and then that could affect the microbiome and vice versa. Um, but in terms of those biodirectional interactions, I think it's also an open question of like, does having a certain microbiome make people more or less resistant to helminths versus does having helminths shape what the microbiome looks like, right? And so I think we have to get at that better still. That sounds like an interesting interaction effect that you could think about when you all these studies are showing quite mixed findings whether whether helminths help for like multiple sclerosis or these or you know Crohn's or whatever but and they see sometimes they do sometimes they don't maybe this is what's going on but there's some interaction right yeah no absolutely um yeah I think it's also interesting thing about long-term exposure and like how fast we think the microbiome is changing again in the non-human primate context I thought about this when they're like oh well we'll deworm the primates and we'll look for differences and or we'll look at when an individual does or doesn't but I feel like um the deworming medication could actually affect the microbiome itself, first of all. And then like in wild primates, if a primate has a parasite one week and then doesn't the next week, my assumption is that they're gonna have the parasite perhaps again the next week. And so my question also becomes kind of, um, you know, is the exposure frequent enough that you don't even see a difference whether the parasite is there or not, but it, it's there enough over a long period of time that you see the microbial differences and it's gonna be hard to actually pull infected and non-infected apart. Um, so anyway, I think thinking about time scale is interesting. Um, how helpful are things like probiotics? Are they a gimmick? So <laughs> this is a complicated answer because I think probiotics, 
will ultimately be a really important health tool um, in terms of being able to introduce different microbes back into a system that's missing them. Um, prebiotics also, which is essentially like microbe food, like fiber is a prebiotic. It'll support potentially beneficial microbes. Um, I think we think actually a prebiotic probiotic mix is probably going to be the best in the long run um, because there's been studies in mice where you, if you put them on a low fiber diet, they actually lose microbes across generations. They lose the fiber degrading microbes. Um, and if you introduce those microbes back into the mice in like generation four, the microbes can't survive because there's still no fiber in the diet. Um, and so you have to introduce both the microbes and the fiber back in um, to get that microbe to actually establish in the gut. Um, that said, most of the probiotics that are on the market right now, um, I would say have not as much research behind them as I would want there to be. <laughs> um, you know, I think what we do know is that probiotics tend to show up in fecal samples while people are taking them. So they're probably in the system, but we don't really know if they're establishing and they tend to disappear after a person stops taking the probiotics. Um, we, there's also been a study that shows that giving somebody a single probiotic after they take antibiotics, like with a single strain of microbes, can actually make their microbial community um, kind of uh, rebound back to what it where, where it was before slower. Um, so it can actually slow down that process um, as opposed to not doing anything, which I know many of us are like, oh, I took an antibiotic, I'm gonna take a probiotic. Um, Sometimes that might not work, but again, this study was looking at like a single strain. Um, so the question comes in, you know, if it was um, kind of a community of microbes and there was a prebiotic also, maybe that would actually be more beneficial, right? And so I think we really need to start to, um, or we are doing it, people are doing it. And I think we need to wait till the research gets a little bit farther in terms of um, being able to say like this probiotic is for sure good. Um, a lot of what's on the shelf, at least in the US is, um, mostly a gimmick, I would say. <laughs> um, Rose asks, I'd love to hear a bit more about the impact of antibiotics as the use of them medi a mediating factor in some of these relationships um, and do they lower the, the quality? Yeah, I think it could be, right? So when you take an antibiotic, um, those antibiotics may be kind of broader spectrum or narrower spectrum, but they're not necessarily targeting you microbe that's infecting someone, right? They're targeting at least a group of microbes, if not all microbes, they come into contact depending on how they work. Um, and so there's a lot of collateral damage from antibiotics. Uh, so they absolutely lower the diversity of the microbiome. Um, the question becomes kind of how much do they lower it and how much and how quickly does the microbiome bounce back? Um, which I moved through it kind of quickly, but that one kind of plot I showed suggests that it depends on the person and kind of where your microbiome was to start with and how many, you know, is this the first time you had an antibiotic? Is this the 50th time? Um, what was the dose? What kind of antibiotic? Um, I think all of that matters. Um, but I do think that in terms of human studies and thinking about um, people's health care and what sorts of treatments they're taking um, to alleviate symptoms um, or, or treat a disease, we do need to be thinking about that because that could absolutely be interacting with, with these things. Thank you. Um, is there a window of time for development where the microbiome is most important? So if, if month one of the baby is exposed to conditions which lead to diverse microbiome, then has a life where living conditions deteriorate, will the microbiome be buffered by an important development window? I think that's a great question. I think we need more longitudinal data to start to answer that. Um, with this being a relatively new field, you know, a lot of the existing cohort studies weren't collecting fecal samples. They were probably collecting everything else. <laughs> um, and so people have either started to collect fecal samples in conjunction with those existing studies or have started their own new studies. Um, but we've only gotten kind of a certain length of time out, right, on those to know what's going on. Um, my instinct would be that yes, if you are in kind of good conditions as an infant and develop a resilient microbiome, um, then you're more likely to be resilient to changes later in life. Um, there does be appear to be um, a critical window um, for the microbiome training the immune system. Now this was done in mice, but it showed that you know, germ-free mice, um, so mice have no microbes, their immune system does not work the right way, it's underdeveloped. Um, but if you introduce microbes back in before a certain age, that can fix itself. Whereas if you do it after that age, um, the immune system does not 
snap back, right? It doesn't develop properly. Um, there's people, I think, starting to think there may be a similar thing for um, microbiome and nervous system development. Um, and I suspect, I mean, it makes sense to me, I haven't seen data on it yet, that there's probably a similar thing going on for metabolism. Um, so I would like to think that having kind of a good microbiome in early life will kind of program the system the way it should be, and people might be more resilient moving forward. Um, but I don't think we have great data on that yet. Thank you. We have two more questions. I realize I'm bombarding you with loads of questions. <laughs> it's so fascinating. Um, uh, Grezhner asks again, breast milk is the best, but if a mother has unhealthy microbiome, should we worry about how her breast milk is going to influence the infant's microbiome? That's mm. a great question. And I think it comes down to us needing to better understand where mom's breast milk microbiome comes from um, and what's driving both the microbes in breast milk and which oligosaccharides are being produced. Um, I think the oligosaccharides um, to some extent may be associated with like immune function. And so, um, you know, something like mom's diet might not affect that. Um, there are questions Again, there's questions about whether microbes are translocating in mom's body from like other places of the body to the breast tissue. Um, I'm not sure that we know a lot about that or whether it's actual actually a viable pathway right now. Um, there's also um, evidence that um, microbes from the infant's oral cavity will actually colonize um, like the nipple and breast tissue. And so there may actually be a back and forth in terms of um, you know, the milk having microbes, but then the baby having microbes also that are, are colonizing mom's breast. And so um, my instinct would be to say that if mom has a quote unquote bad gut microbiome, I don't think it would necessarily affect the breast milk microbiome. Um, I think there may be other factors that are more important, but again, I think we still need to learn more there. And, um from Rebecca, do you, you have any thoughts about whether the maternal microbiome can affect a child's birth weight, presumably through links between microbes and host energetic status? Yeah, I think that it potentially can. Um, you know, I've been really interested in the pregnancy microbiome literature. A lot of that literature is looking at what microbes mom pass on to baby. So it's actually more infant focused in terms of kind of um, postnatal uh, microbiome development, postnatal growth patterns. In terms of actual birth weight, um, I would suspect it does. A lot of the microbiome studies in pregnancy that are only looking at pregnancy tend to be looking at like, does mom's microbiome change during pregnancy? And there's been a suggestion that the microbiome during pregnancy may be more energy efficient, that it produces additional energy for mom. Um, but if you look at the human literature, that mostly comes from one study um, in Finland. Um, and so it's really cool. Um, but some of the other human studies suggest there isn't such a strong relationship. Um, and so I think there might be a really cool interaction between the environment and then mom's metabolism, but also immune system. And then what happens during pregnancy in terms of um, kind of what is, um, what are mom's environmental exposures to like infectious disease? And does that alter um, how the immune system responds during pregnancy, how much it has to change or not change in terms of its function? Um, because those immune system changes are what I appear to be driving changes in the microbiome um, during pregnancy. Um, studies from non-human primates where we have like really detailed dietary data suggests that diet is not correlated with changes during pregnancy in the microbiome. Um, and so I think it's the hormonal shifts and the associated immune shifts. And so, yeah, my question becomes, you know, how much are the hormones shifting? How much is the immune system shifting? Um, and yeah, what is mom's kind of um, nutritional environment? And I think depending on those things, then the microbiome could actually play a pretty big role in um, child's birth weight. Thank you. Um, <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Sorry, my cat's just, um... <laughs> all right. Uh, just a comment from uh, Gabriella saying a collaboration between yourself and Katie Hind in Arizona would give some fascinating results on the impact of breast milk on the microbiome. Sorry about this. And the effect of baby's microbiome on milk composition. If yeah, no, it would be yeah, fascinating. I know um, she had a student that was doing microbiome for a little bit. Um, so she started to do a little bit of that. Um, and there was some interesting stuff. I know um, 
Megan Azad, um, who's associated with the child uh, study in Canada, is also doing some really cool breast milk microbiome stuff. Um, so um, those are, are good places to kind of start to look. It, yeah, it, it would be very cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in for the last one of the term. We will see you all again in the autumn. And um, I'm going to end the broadcast now. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs>